Andrew Apostoli, a member of the Franciscan Friars of the Renewal. Tonight, we're going to deal with the sanctifying gifts of, of the Holy Spirit. Tonight, we'll deal with the gift of knowledge, a very important gift, helping us to relate to the world in a Christian way. But we're very happy to have in the audience tonight some very special guests, and that is four of our young sisters who yesterday became novices in the Franciscan Sisters of the Renewal. I'd like to introduce them. They're sitting in the front row tonight. They're Sister Guadalupe Magdalena de la Santa Cruz of the Holy Cross. Then Sister Mercy Faustina of the Hearts of Jesus and Mary. Sister Ruth Therese of the Precious Blood and Sister Kelly Francis of the Humble Heart of Jesus. We're so proud of them and very happy that they have said yes to God's call to a religious vocation. As you know, we are in the year of the priesthood, but we can't forget also our need to pray for religious vocations. Men and women who are consecrated to God were offering their lives in service to God himself and also to his church. So please pray for these young religious sisters as well as all religious and priests that they will be faithful to their vocation, be able by God's grace to persevere and to serve the church. Didn't Jesus say, the, you know, the harvest is indeed great, but the laborers are few. So ask the Lord of the harvest to send laborers to gather in the harvest. I know every day I pray for vocations and we should always pray for uh, the needs of the church. They are great. And that's, I think, with more vocations, holy vocations, as Pope Benedict said recently, when talking about priests during the year of the priesthood, he said we need holy priests. We need holy priests and holy religious. So please keep them in your prayers. A very important petition. Well, tonight we're going to be talking about a very important gift, and that is the Holy Spirit's gift of knowledge. You know, we have all kinds of knowledge in our lives. We need it. You know, just to function in daily life, there's so many things we have to know. For example, if we're going to talk about uh, our work, our family life, um, uh, about, the, you know, travel, just even to travel from one place to another. We've got to know a lot about these things. So we've got to have knowledge of all kinds. But knowledge is what helps us to make good choices. If we have the right knowledge and we understand properly, well, then we can make good choices in life and you know even our religious knowledge that's most important of all isn't it because the choices we make will affect our eternal destiny and that is something that is should be primary in our lives um, why did God make us why are we here and how can we fulfill in this life those things that will help us to come to eternal life this is certainly very very important our values the truths we live by, the convictions that we have, these are all very important parts of the knowledge that we need for eternal life. Now, when we talk tonight about the gifts of the Holy Spirit, remember, the Holy Spirit himself is called the gift of God. Jesus said that to the woman, the Samaritan woman at the well. Remember when he was talking to her? And he said to her in part of the conversation, if only you knew the gift of God. That was a reference to the Holy Spirit. He said, well, then you would, and if you knew who I was, you would ask me and I would give you living water, the gift of the Holy Spirit. He wanted so much to give that to that woman. So he referred to the Holy Spirit as the gift of God. So does St. Paul in his second letter to young Timothy. In chapter 1, verses 6 to 7, St. Paul writes this, I remind you, to stir into flame the gift of God bestowed when my hands were laid on you. The spirit God has given us is no cowardly spirit, but rather one that makes us strong, loving, and wise. In other words, what he was referring to, St. Paul, was the fact that when he ordained uh, young Timothy, his disciple, when he ordained him, he passed on the Holy Spirit. He said, the gift of God that you have in you from my laying on of hands. And we know that, as he said, the Spirit is not a cowardly one, but as he said, it's one that makes us strong. And we have to be strong in our struggle today to overcome the world and its opposition to Christ. 
Uh, we have to be loving, and we can't be loving by ourselves of our own power. We don't have that grace to do that. We need God's grace, and it's the Holy Spirit who makes us loving, devoted, uh, dedicated, and above all, we need to be wise so that we can make those right choices. Now, you know, the Holy Spirit gives different kinds of gifts. Some of them are called the charismatic gifts. These are the gifts he gives that help the work of the church. The Holy Spirit, St. Paul refers to these in his first letter to the Corinthians, chapter 12, when he says that the Spirit gives his gifts as he chooses. In other words, the charismatic gifts are given to different individuals for different purposes. For example, you've got the gift of miracles. And maybe miracles are worked by certain, uh, usually very saintly people. Uh, they work those miracles to prove the truths of the Catholic Church and uh, to bring glory and honor to Almighty God. Didn't our Lord himself do that when he Gave, when he forgave the sins of the paralyzed man in the gospel and people were criticizing him. Who can forgive sins? Only God can forgive sins. And then Jesus said, well, what is harder, what is easy, easier to do? To say to the man, your sins are forgiven or to say, arise and walk? And obviously it's easier to say your sins are forgiven because nobody can prove it. So he did the harder thing. He said to the man, stand up, take up your mat and go home. And the paralyzed man was instantly cured. So miracles are often done to confirm the truths of our faith and to help those in need. Other charismatic gifts include discernment of spirits, when we want to know if something is really from God or is it from the devil or even from one's own person. You know, it could be a projection of oneself. Or people are, feel that they're inspired. Is it really coming from God or is it just coming from ourselves? Or is the devil, does he have a hand in these things? So the church needs people with the gift of discernment of spirits. And finally, another gift would be prophecy. You know, where we people need that, the gift of prophecy to um, um, call people to action, to stir people up. We need prophets in the church today. People who will guide us, who know clearly the truth and the right road to take. And, and they can really stir people to action. If we don't have prophets, we're going to be like sheep without a shepherd. Uh, I remember, I, I, in my opinion, Bishop, Archbishop Fulton Sheen uh, was a great prophet in our times. He, he said so many things that had such clarity and such conviction and, and really proved to be very true. He, and way back in 1952, he said, if people accept contraception, then abortion, euthanasia, and violence will follow. 1952, he said that. Many people objected and said, well, those things will never happen in America, and they've all happened. You know, he was a very great man of, uh, he had a great sense of prophecy in the church. Um, but the other gifts we want to focus on are the sanctifying gifts. These are the gifts that the Holy Spirit uses to help us grow in holiness. And uh, they, they help us by to practice the virtues. They strengthen the virtues. They, they enlighten our mind to know more clearly the things God wants us to do. We've been talking about knowledge that we need to make right choices. Well, these, some of these gifts help us precisely to make those right choices by letting us see things the way God wants us to see them. Remember, even Peter needed that gift, didn't he? When, when he, uh, in the gospel, uh, Jesus asked his disciples, who do you say that I am? And Peter was uh, enlightened by the heavenly father, remember? He said to Jesus, you are the Christ, the Messiah, the son of the living God. But right after that, when Jesus talked about, you know, his coming passion and suffering and death, Peter tried to talk him out of that. And the Lord said, remember, get behind me, Satan. You think the thoughts of men and not of God. He had a long way to go in understanding, you know, to come to true knowledge of uh, of the, the real message of Jesus, and we do too. And that's why we need the gifts of the Holy Spirit. We find them listed in the prophet Isaiah, chapter 11, verses 1 to 3. And we read there, But a shoot shall sprout from the stump of Jesse, and from his roots a bud shall blossom. The Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, a spirit of wisdom and of understanding a spirit of counsel and of strength, a spirit of knowledge and of fear of the Lord. And his delight shall be the fear of the Lord. Usually that second fear of the Lord they refer to as 
piety. Well, tonight we're going to talk about this gift of knowledge. Now, there's different kinds of knowledge. You know, our first parents, Adam and Eve, had knowledge. They, they had infused knowledge. Remember, Adam was able to name all the animals, yet he never studied zoology. Uh, you and I, we have confused knowledge many times, don't we? Huh? We've got many things we're ignorant of or many mistakes in our th thinking and sometimes even some distortions in our thinking. Um, and so we need to, to uh, grow in true knowledge. Huh? Now, knowledge can be about natural things, about the world, as I mentioned, about life and so on. Sometimes it's about philosophy, you know, where we maybe look at the world and try to see you know, the reflection of God in the world here, you know, and, you know, in philosophy, I remember we studied about the existence of God, that God was the, was the prime mover, intelligent design. There's such a debate today about that and how people could say that the order in the universe doesn't reflect an intelligent uh, creator. <laughs> to me, I, I often think of the words of scripture that say, you know, only a fool would say in their heart, there is no God. You know, the, the very order, the beauty, the goodness of the world reflect the goodness and intelligence of a supreme being. But what we want to talk about tonight is called the science of the saints. This is this gift of the Holy Spirit. By it, the Holy Spirit helps us to judge rightly concerning the world around us. How are we to live in this world? Are these beautiful things that God made? Are we to love them for their own sake? Or are we to love them for God's sake? Are they going to help us get closer to the Lord? Or will they be obstacles to our journey because they can become so attractive in themselves that we want to love them for their own sake? What we really need to do is have this gift of the Holy Spirit to help us really evaluate the world around us as God sees us. And that's what this gift of knowledge of the Holy Spirit gives us. And that's why it's called the science of the saints, because the saints were known to have a right attitude in judging the value of the world and in helping them in their real proper relationship to God. It's very, certainly very, very important. It comes from the Holy Spirit. He kind of sheds a light into our mind. And uh, this helps us to, to see even the, the purpose for which God created the world and even God present in the world, working in the world, um, his providence. Every day, you know, the, the sun rises and uh, we begin a new day. Uh, I always remember Father La Cordera the, was a great Dominican writer. He said, the only thing I know about tomorrow is that God's providence will rise before the sun. So God is always arranging things for our good, isn't he? Even before the day begins, he's got us in mind. And so we, we need this illuminating light of the Holy Spirit, which helps our faith to grow. You know, uh, how many people consider the treasures of the world as their goal? Maybe they want to make a lot of money. They want a lot of fame, beauty, popularity, but they use it in a distorted way. And Jesus said, don't lay up for yourself treasures, you know, in this world, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither thief can break in to steal and the moth can't de destroy it and, and rust won't come. So we need this gift of knowledge from the Holy Spirit. And we're going to talk about that. We're going to be taking a break very soon and we'll talk about how God manifests himself to us through his creatures if we are willing to look at creation the way God wants us to do so. We're going to take a break now. We'll be right back. a gift of the Holy Spirit, a sanctifying gift that helps us to look at the world the way God wants us to appreciate it and value it so that we can make right decisions on how to use the things of the world to get us closer to God, not keep us away from Him. You know, first of all, through this gift, 
we learn to see God's attributes. We can, you know, as we look at creation, we learn, we see the beauty of God. You know, just the other day when we celebrated yesterday the Feast of the Assumption of the Blessed Virgin Mary, I remember uh, some of the brothers went out. We have a, little, a few rose uh, plants, a little rose uh, bushes on our, on our property, and they cut some roses for, uh, to place before the Blessed Virgin Mary in the chapel. Very simple, but you know, those roses are so beautiful. And they add a certain sense of beauty. Beauty lifts our souls. And, and this is what we learn from creation if we look at it to see God in creation, to see the beauty of God who is the source of that beauty. Uh, at the same time, we also uh, recognize the power of God. You know, when we, um, when we see maybe you go up to Niagara Falls and you see that water come in over those falls and you realize how powerful God is. Huh? Um, his goodness, when he, Jesus himself had said, you know, our heavenly father, he clothes the lilies of the field, he feeds the birds of the air. We learn so many beautiful things from our, our love, our contact with nature. St. John of the Cross was very, uh, stressed this point very, very much so. And so, of course, did St. Francis. You know, he began to see God in everything. Here's what St. Bonaventure, who wrote one of the biographies of St. Francis, he put it this way. He said, Francis sought occasion to love God in everything. He delighted in all the works of God's hands. And from the vision of joy on earth, his mind soared aloft to the life-giving source and cause of all. That's God himself. So we went from the creature to the creator. St. Bonaventure continues, he says, in everything beautiful, he saw him who is beauty itself. Isn't that beautiful? Isn't that a wonderful thought? By the beautiful things God made, we should come to love God who is the source of beauty itself. And St. Bonaventure continues, and he followed his beloved everywhere by his likeness imprinted on creation. In other words, St. Bonaventure is saying that St. Francis saw God reflected in everything in creation. And that's the way we should have that same attitude. And we gain that attitude through this gift of knowledge, through this light of the Holy Spirit who helps us look at the world in the right way. Not as something that leads us away from God, because if we love creatures for their own sake, for their own beauty, then that will become an obstacle, and we'll talk about that in a moment. But let me just finish this thought of St. Francis. And so, all of creation, he made a ladder by which he might mount up and embrace him who is all desirable. So, the things of creation led him, like ascending a ladder, to come closer and closer to God. And as a sign of this, let me share with you the beautiful poem, at least part of that poem, that he wrote called the Canticle of brother's son. Uh, let me read a part of this. He wrote this about a year before he died. In fact, it's all about the creatures God made and he praises God for them. And he was actually almost blind at the time he wrote this. He could hardly see the sun or the moon and the stars and, and that he wrote about. Uh, yet he had them fixed in his mind and heart. So they were constantly with him. In fact, he, he wrote this canticle and he, when the brothers went out preaching, he wanted them to sing it to the people. In fact, many of you would know that this, the song, the modern version, is called All Creatures of Our God and King. And this is what St. Francis wrote in his canticle of Brother's Son. Listen to all the creatures that he calls upon to give glory to God. He said, All praise be yours, my Lord, through all that you have made, and first, my Lord, Brother's Son brother. Everything's a brother and sister to St. Francis. Brother, son, who brings the day and light you give to us through him. How beautiful is he, how radiant in all his splendor. Of you, most high, he bears the likeness. So he sees the sun as a symbol reflecting God to us, the light of God. All praise be yours, my Lord, through sister moon and stars. In the heavens you have made them bright and precious and fair. All praise be yours, my Lord, through brothers wind and air, and the, the fair and stormy all the weather's moods by which you cherish all that you have made. All praise be yours, my Lord, through sister water, so useful, lowly, precious, and pure. 
All praise be yours, my Lord, through Brother Fire, through whom you brighten up the night. How beautiful he is, how lively, how full of power and strength. All praise be yours, my Lord, through Sister Earth, our mother, who, fe who feeds us in her sovereignty and produces various fruits with colored flowers and herbs. So he was really almost like a symphony, wasn't he? Inviting all creation to give praise to the Creator. And that's why St. Bonaventure said he saw, he saw the visible creation around him as like a ladder leading us step by step to the source of all that beauty, the source of all that goodness, the source of all that power that he saw reflected in nature. And that's why it's so important that we love the things God made to help us get closer to him. But as I said to you before, if we end up loving these things that God made, for their own sake, hmm? well, then they become obstacles instead of a stepping stone. For example, if money becomes our goal and we want to have as much, as, as much of it as possible and never share with those in need, well, then that money, that's going to become an obstacle to us, isn't it? Huh? When we fall into the sin of avarice, when we forget the needs of the poor. Yet if we have, if we've been blessed to have financial resources, if we use them to help the poor, to help those in need, then these earthly blessings will become again stepping stones to loving God and loving others. Or supposing people have a gift of beauty. Hmm? They can use that beauty to honor God. Or they could end up using that beauty to lead themselves and others astray. Person who uses their sexual beauty in the wrong way to tempt people if they dress immodestly or in, in fashions that are very offensive, they can end up leading a lot of people into sin. If they, if they want to live just for that, you know, to draw that kind of attention, uh, they're using the gift of beauty in the wrong way because beauty can be used you know, to help others. I remember a wonderful story told by Archbishop Sheen. He was on a plane one day, and there was a, a very attractive stewardess. And he said to her, you know, God has blessed you with beauty. You should be willing to use your gift of beauty to help others. Well, he forgot about that encounter. And two years later, he was on another airplane, and that stewardess came over to him. She said, Bishop, do you remember me? And he said, no, and who are you? He said, well, I'm the woman you spoke to me two years ago, and you told me that I should consider using my beauty to help other people. And he, she said, I am ready to do that. What should I do? Do you know what he assigned her to? He sent her to a leper colony in Vietnam before the war that was there so that she could use her beauty among people who had no beauty. It would make their lives, it would give a certain joy that someone so beautiful would work among them. So we can use the gifts God gives us in the right way or the wrong way. As I said, if we love the creatures for their own sake, they will become obstacles. And you know who, in, who experienced that? Was the great, one of the greatest saints in the Catholic Church, also one of the greatest converts in the Catholic Church, St. Augustine. Remember, when he wrote his confessions years later, he thought back to his sinful life. And that, by the way, is one of the effects of this gift of knowledge, the knowledge of the Holy Spirit, is when we come to see the proper meaning of creation, we begin to lament the times, maybe in the past in our lives, when we misused that creation. And so it leads to sorrow for sin. It also leads to a, a, uh, a joy. We'll see how this gift brings joy into our hearts because we know the beauty that God has prepared for us. But let's get back to St. Augustine for a moment here. So he looked back as he was writing his book, The Confessions. And you remember he, he, when he started off that book, he said, God, you have made our hearts for yourself and they are ever restless until they rest in you. Isn't that the story of every human heart? There's nothing in creation that can totally satisfy us. Why? Because God put an infinite hunger in the heart 
and the only one who's infinite is God himself. Imagine if you had a, you were starving, you had a, you had a tremendous hunger. You felt like you could eat a whole pizza pie. Hmm? And somebody gave you just a little, uh, uh, maybe a little uh, cracker or something like that to eat. That's certainly not going to satisfy you, is it? Huh? The hunger is too great. And so the hunger that God put in us was a hunger for himself. And that's why St. Augustine said, you made our hearts for yourself, and they are ever restless until they rest in you. And St. Augustine realized that. Now listen to what he wrote, these beautiful words, one of the most famous quotes in all of Christian literature. He said, Late have I loved you, O beauty, ever ancient, ever new. Late have I loved you. In other words, he lamented all the years that he had wasted. Remember, he, he prayed. He was, his problem was... The obstacle was he was living a life of unchastity, of impurity. He was li lived with one woman, then he, without marriage, then he left her and lived with another one. And, um, and he knew now that he had put off his conversion. He prayed for 12 years, God, give me chastity, but not yet. He didn't think he could live without these sins, these sinful habits. And so he goes on to say, you were within me, but I was outside. In other words, you were with me, just that I wasn't looking for you inside. I was looking around, out in creation. And it was there that I searched for you. See, even when you're looking for happiness in the wrong way, you may not realize it, but you're really looking for God, aren't you? Because he's the only one that can totally satisfy us. In my unloveliness, St. Augustine said, I plunged into the lovely things which you created. See, he recognized their beauty. In this case, a sexual beauty. But he was using it the wrong way, not the way God intended in marriage, where a couple make a covenant of love and are committed to each other with the blessing of God in, their, in a sacrament of marriage and then bring forth new life as a family. He was using... He was searching for that sexual beauty and love in the wrong way. He said, you were with me, but I was not with you. Created things, and here's the point I wanted to get to. Created things kept me from you. Yet, if they had not been in you, they would not have been at all. In other words, what he's saying, the very things you created with all their beauty, which should have been things helping me to come to you, because I love them for their own sake instead of for your sake. They are the things that kept me from you. That's what he's saying there. And you know how many people today, they're looking for that happiness. As I said, God put that desire for that happiness in our hearts. But they're looking in the wrong way. They're looking to satisfy only themselves. They've forgotten how to give. They've forgotten how to respect the good things God made so that they could see the reflection of the Creator. It's only when they became free, just like St. Augustine, on, you know, when he read in the, the letter of St. Paul to the Romans, chapter 13. If, you don't, if you've never read it, I encourage you to read it. When he read where it's now the hour for you to wake from sleep because your conversion is nearer than when you first came to believe. In other words, God was saying to St. Augustine through those words of St. Paul, you put off your conversion long enough. You've been sleeping too long. Get up. And, and he read there where St. Paul said, make no provision for the deeds of the flesh. Rather, put on the Lord Jesus Christ. And there was his answer. By finding Christ, he understood the true, what true beauty was all about. And he gave up the sinful beauty, the lust that he was living in, he gave it all up because he had found the source of happiness. He goes on to say this beautiful quote. We can't keep this out. You called, God, you called, you shouted, and you broke through my deafness. You know, he needed to hear. You flashed a light, you shone, and you dispelled my blindness. You breathed your fragrance on me, and I drew in breath, and now I pant for you. I have tasted you, now I hunger and thirst for more. You touched me and I burned for your peace. There he had found true beauty, true happiness. We're going to take a break now. We'll be right back.
Welcome back. I'm Father Andrew Apostoli. Uh, we've been talking about the gift of knowledge, and I forgot to mention before the break that it's usually now that we take calls from our viewers. So we have a call from John. John, where are you from, and what's your question or your whatever you wish to share? Oh, thanks, Father Andrew. God bless you. Uh, I'm John from Ohio, and uh, first of all, comment. I've been looking at the uh, novices and their smiles. This is a quote from Mark Twain that uh, is kind of relevant, and it sounded like what you were saying about Augustine. Mark said, never let your career get in the way of your education. And if you think about it, there's a little bit of irony and humor there. And also, I wanted to ask, when the gift of knowledge comes in, can it come in simply in everyday life? Or, I mean, can a person be wrapped in contemplation and just really still and at peace, and it could come in then? I was kind of curious about that, so I'll hang up now. All right, John, thank you. That's a good question. How does this gift come to us? Well, the Holy Spirit works in so many different ways. Sometimes it can come through things we read or even listening to the program tonight. People may become aware, hey, you know, this is a gift. I should be praying to the Holy Spirit to grow in this gift of knowledge. By the way, we all have the seven sanctifying gifts that I mentioned from Isaiah. We have all of them from the time of our baptism. As long as you're in the state of grace, the Holy Spirit is present within you. And therefore, all of these gifts are present in the individual. It's not the same way with the charismatic gifts. Those gifts are given to different individuals according to the purpose the Holy Spirit has in mind in, you know, giving a gift. But the gifts, uh, the sanctifying gifts are given to everyone. And that's why uh, it's important for us to cultivate those gifts. First of all, we do that by prayer, by being more aware of the Holy Spirit, by keeping God's commandments. Remember, uh, uh, in one of the Psalms, King David says, I have more understanding and learning than my elders because I keep your commandments. You know, if you keep the commandments of God, you will grow in a clarity of knowing God's will more and more. So to go back to John's question, you know, how do we come to uh, this gift of knowledge? Well, again, by daily living, the Holy Spirit will enlighten us as to what's right, what's not good. Huh? We, we can learn by experience. Um, there's a story uh, told, it was shared by St. Alphonsus Liguori about a, um, a, in ancient times in ancient Rome, there was a, a philosopher, and through his writings and so on, speeches, he became very wealthy. And the story was that he was, he was crossing the Mediterranean with all of his possessions, and the boat sank. He was saved, but he lost all that he had. And he made a comment. He said, make sure that your treasures are things you will never lose in a shipwreck. So he had learned through that experience what really was important and what was not important, huh? what you could so easily lose. I imagine uh, many people, I know that pe a lot of people have experienced uh, great financial problems lately, and some people probably lost an awful lot of money with the, the stocks going down and so on and so forth. I've heard a lot about that. I don't have any stocks myself, but um, you know, so I, I don't read the Wall Street Journal, so I don't know exactly what's going on. But, uh, but I do know people have lost a great deal of money and, and wonder if maybe it didn't affect them to think, was I putting maybe too much trust in that? Did God take that away so that he might teach me that he's my treasure? Because a lot of times when we have a lot of the material things of this world, we end up prizing them uh, before God himself. You know, they become more important. So the Lord has ways of calling us to himself, making himself the focus in our life. We have another call here now from Joe. Joe, where are you from? And what's your question or what would you like to share? Hey, Father, I'm calling from Florida. And if a person is in a state of mortal sin, how do you get back the uh, gift of the Holy Spirit? And what is the Holy Spirit exactly? 
Okay, very good question, Joe. Well, how do you get back the gifts of the Holy Spirit? By getting back into the state of grace. As I mentioned, uh, as long as you're in the state of grace, then uh, the Holy Spirit will be with you, and the gifts are always present. They have to be developed, though. I'll come back to that point in a moment. You know, we only lose the state of grace by mortal sin. Someone once said, you know, if you're not as close to God now as you were five years ago, you know who moved. Hmm? The Holy Spirit does not move away from us. We move away from him. And that's precisely what happens, unfortunately, when a person commits a mortal sin. A mortal sin is really a serious offense against God's love. It usually has to involve a serious matter where we, we have uh, 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 sufficient knowledge that we are doing serious wrong and we give full consent to that. If we do that, we break our relationship to God. We lose that presence of God that came to us through the gift we call sanctifying grace, that indwelling of the Blessed Trinity that we received on the day of our baptism. If we have the misfortune to fall into mortal sin and lose that presence of God, we should try to make an act of perfect love and contrition right away to tell God we're truly sorry for our sins because they have offended him who is all good and worthy of all our love. Then we should go to confession as soon as we can to have that sin removed. That's important. And then we are free to return to the sacrament, especially the Eucharist. We can receive the Eucharist again with a, a pure heart, a heart that is ready to receive the Lord. So it's important to get back into that state of grace. Now, once, you're, once you have God dwelling in you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, as I said to you, the, the seven sanctifying gifts are all there. But they have to grow. Um, when we first receive them in our baptism, they're not yet developed. Let me give you an example. A newborn infant, let's say an infant the, the two months old, that infant will have 10 fingers. God willing, we hope it's a, you know, a healthy, uh, uh, normal little infant, okay? That infant will have 10 fingers, okay, on, the, on its hands. Now, at that age, two months old, that infant cannot hold a sledgehammer in their hands. They've got 10 fingers, but they, the fingers are not developed enough to hold that. When they become an adult, then they can hold that maybe a sledgehammer with its weight in their hands. See, they've developed. They've developed the ability. They've grown. And so when we are living in God's love, those gifts within us are growing, just like the hands grow, the fingers grow, okay? Um, they grow in proportion to the, the rest of our body. So it is in the spiritual life. The gifts of the Holy Spirit grow in proportion as our charity, our faith, our hope, and our charity grow in us. So that's, that's how we, we get those, those gifts and how they develop. Now, the question that Joe had given, the second part of it, who is the Holy Spirit? Well, he is the third divine person, and he is the love of the Father and the Son for one another. This is the best way we can describe it. The Father and the Son in the life of the, the Blessed Trinity love each other with such an infinite love. In a sense, that love is a divine person. That's the best way we can understand it. To, extend, to understand it completely, you would have to be the fourth person of the Blessed Trinity, okay? And none of us are. So the, 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 uh, the way we usually explain the, the Holy Spirit as the proceeding from the love of the Father and the Son. That's why we say in the Creed, we believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, Lord means divine, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. By their love coming together, that's who the Holy Spirit is, a divine person. Uh, and he's given to us as a gift, as I mentioned earlier in the program tonight. He is the gift of God. We have another call now from Kent. Kent, where are you from, and what's your question? Good evening, Father. I'm from Champaign, Illinois, and I add that in the uh, that through the intercession of St. John Vianney, God can 
the breast you and and all priests. Thank you. Uh, my question is that uh, <clears throat> in the Garden of Eden, God created the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Presumably, it in itself was good, yet God forbade our original parents from partaking of the fruit of that tree. So I'm wondering what connection there might be between that and the gift of the Holy Spirit as knowledge, uh, which presumably also is good. That's a very good question, a very interesting one, Ken. Thank you. Uh, the, the, when we say that the tree in the garden of, uh, of Eden, paradise, was the, uh, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, uh, for the Jewish people, the idea of knowledge would have meant also an experience. See, when the devil tempted Eve, she spoke to Eve, and through Eve got to Adam. When he spoke to Eve, he said, he said, did God really tell you that you shouldn't eat of any tree in the garden? She said, well, we're free to eat of all the trees except this tree called the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And uh, the, the, the devil made her, first of all, question God's commands. And the second thing then, he said, he went from there to say, well, you know why God told you he doesn't want you to eat of that tree because then you will know good and evil as God knows good and evil. But the difference was this. God's knowledge of good, he enjoys all good. He experiences all good. But his knowledge of evil is a knowledge through the knowing how evil works, but he doesn't experience evil. In the life of the Trinity, there is no suffering. There's no kind of evil in God himself. He is beyond all of that. He's infinitely perfect. See, so what, what, he, what the devil was setting them up for was a half-truth. He said, look, you'll be like gods, knowing good and evil. God knows all good and all evil, but he knows good by experience. He knows evil by its causes. I'll give you an example. A, a uh, surgeon who works with cancer doesn't have to have cancer in order to know something about it. He knows about it through his studies. He knows about it through perhaps surgery on cancer patients that, he, that, it, that the person has worked with, the doctor has worked with. See, he knows cancer but doesn't experience it. So when the devil tempted our first parents, he was setting them up, deceiving them, thinking that they would know good. They, in fact, all they did know up to that point was good, the blessings of God. They were at peace with God, with creation, with one another. All they knew was good. All they experienced was good. But when they ate the fruit of that tree, they experienced evil, which brought all kinds of suffering. They, uh, they actually felt evil. Do you see what I mean? In other words, they, they were ashamed, they were naked, they, they, they hid from one another, they were afraid to speak with God. Um, and so that was, that was the kind of knowledge that that tree gave. The Holy Spirit gives us a knowledge that helps us to look at creation properly. So it's a slightly different kind of thing. But it is related also to experience because the, the gift of the knowledge of the Holy Spirit helps us to make the right choices. See, when we possess this gift, in fact, as it develops and grows, we, we lose our attraction for the world. Things in the world, you know, to very saintly people who have this gift of the knowledge of the Holy Spirit, you know, this, this uh, gift we've been talking about, they no longer really have an interest. Money may have meant something years ago. Pleasure may have. Now, their heart is not there anymore. Their heart is being drawn to God. That's, you see that, you know, God, you made our hearts for yourself. And they're ever restless till they rest in you. See what's happening? There's a transformation. And so they want that joy that God alone can give them. And, and that's what the Holy Spirit helps us to embrace. So this gift does help us experience good and to realize what evil is so we can reject it. And that's very important to our spiritual growth. We have another uh, call here from Greg. Greg, thank you for calling. Where are you from and uh, what's your question or what would you like to share? Uh, yes, Father, uh, I'm from Ohio. And uh, my question is, uh, what are the things we can do to increase this gift in us? And, uh, and also, uh, how will this help our understanding of 
supernatural or spiritual things. Thank you. Well, how can we grow in this gift? Well, first of all, to pray. Pray for the gift. Didn't Jesus himself say, he said, if you, evil as you are, know how to give good things to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give the good spirit to those who ask him? That's in the Gospel of St. Luke, the good spirit. Why? Because as we go back to the idea the Holy Spirit is a gift, we ask this gift. And uh, every day we should pray for the Holy Spirit. You know, I, I, I'm a teacher, and very often before my classes, I'm always praying the prayer, Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful. Um, we need the Holy Spirit, and we have to ask him to come. We have to ask our Heavenly Father to send him to us. What, what did the disciples, the first disciples do when, you know, as they were waiting for the Holy Spirit to come on the Feast of Pentecost? Jesus told them, do not leave the city until you have received the gift of my Father, uh, power from on high. And they went and gathered. There were about 120. Our Lady was with them, the 12 apostles, the first disciples of Jesus. They prayed in that upper room for the Holy Spirit to come. And so there's, in a way, there's a beautiful way for us to um, grow in our uh, relationship to the Holy Spirit. Okay. Uh, secondly, remove sin from your life. Remember the woman at the well? who asked Jesus, give me this living water you're talking about. She thought he was talking about H2O in the well. Jesus is talking about the Holy Spirit. But he gave her credit. He said, all right, you want this living water? Go get me your husband. Now, what did he have to do with this? Is he going to give us such a big bucket of water that the husband had to carry it home? No, he only wanted her to look at the kind of life she was living. And remember, she said very nonchalantly, well, I don't have one husband. And Jesus, that's right, you've had five, and the one you're living with now, and I call him Skip, Skip is not your husband. <laughs> and why did he say that? Because water can't flow if you put an obstacle in the stream, right? If they put a dam to prevent the water from flowing on a river, it's not going to flow. You see, you have to remove the obstacle. Her sinfulness was the obstacle. And so we need to remove sin as much as we can to allow the Holy Spirit to work in us. And you know what happens? As we remove sin, it's like being free of its imprisonment. It, it, we kind of become prisoners of uh, a sin, attachment to sin, habits of sin. The more we become free, you know what? The freer we are to follow the inspirations of the Holy Spirit. I think we have time to take just one more call. We've got a call here from Pat. Pat, yes, where are you from, and um, what's your question or, or your comment tonight? Well, Pat, I'm from Lancaster, Pennsylvania, Father, and my comment has to do with the census fidei um, and how it relates to knowledge of the Holy Spirit and knowledge from the Holy Spirit. There are a lot of people out there, especially people who presume themselves to be scholars, such as, say, a Joan Chittister or a Sandra Schneider's, who believe that the uh, Holy Spirit speaks directly to them in ways that oftentimes contradicts the magisterium of the church and often very militantly and, and willfully uh, rejects the magisterium of the church. And I was kind of hoping that you would uh, touch on that and kind of differentiate between those people who, who feel that uh, as long as they see themselves uh, as, as being okay, that, uh, that they are, in fact, okay when, in actuality, they're in opposition to the magisterium. That's a very good point, Pat. You know, uh, people talk about an inner light church. They'll say, I don't need the pope anymore to teach me. I don't need the bishops. I don't need theologians. I'm, gonna, I'm enlightened by the Holy Spirit myself. But many times there's confusion. You know, when we're left to ourselves, we, as I mentioned earlier, we can suffer from ignorance. There's many things we don't know. Uh, we can be in error about many things. We can have many distortions and falsehoods that we pick up from the world. And so we need the guidance of the Holy Spirit, you see, to help us to make those right choices. When Jesus asked the apostles, who do the people say I am? He got a lot of wonderful answers. John the Baptist, Elijah the prophet, Jeremiah uh, a prophet, they were all wrong. When he asked, who do you say I am? And Peter, enlightened by the Father, said, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Well, 
Unfortunately, we're coming to the end of the program here tonight, so uh, we have to use these final moments to uh, I encourage all of you to pray for the Holy Spirit, to ask Him to strengthen your faith, and always remain faithful to the teaching of the church, because with the guidance, we know who's speaking through the Holy Father. We don't always know who's speaking in our own heart. We could be confused <laughs> and misled. Well, let me take this moment to give to all of you as we say goodbye, a blessing. May Almighty God bless you, watch over you, and draw you close to his heart. May Our Lady put her mantle of love and protection over you. I bless you all in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Have a wonderful week. You know, I'd like to say to all of you that are viewing here tonight, thank you for, for being a part of our viewing audience um, you know, Mother Angelica and EWTN have done so much uh, to uh, carry out the work of evangelization in the church. I even Pope Benedict XVI made a comment to someone. He said, the church needs EWTN. And I encourage you as far as you can. I know times are difficult, but to please be as generous as you can to help support this wonderful uh, network that God has raised up. It's a work of God. Mother Angelica simply said yes, and she allowed herself to be God's instrument so we can keep the message of Jesus going out throughout the whole world. This is global Catholic television. Please support EWTN. Again, God bless you all.